can you hear me now? Ho ho, hey, there we are. Welcome, family and friends. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, it's good to see you all. Good morning. <laughs> good to see you guys. I also want to welcome everyone who's online today. Thank you for tuning in and joining us. If you're on Facebook, would you like and share and let everyone know about what's going on today? So we had actually a pretty good service this morning. Uh, the first service was full, something we haven't seen in quite a while. So I'm hoping that we're going to beat that with the second service and fill it up again. So before we get started this morning, I'm going to open us in prayer here. Father God, thank you so much. Lord, for uh, just giving us another day to come and fellowship uh, with each other and uh, just grow closer to each other and grow closer to you, Lord. Lord, I just pray that uh, as we come to you and worship this morning that you would hear us, Lord. Holy Spirit, fill this room, fill our hearts, and Lord, be the words that come out of our mouths this morning as we lead and worship this morning. Uh, God, I pray for uh, just blessings over your congregation. In Jesus' name we pray, and all the church said, Amen. 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 The king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Cause you are good, good. Oh, 
I love to hear the song of creation The wind and the rhythm of the rain Oh, the thunder, it speaks of your power And there's something in the sound of the saints I've been washed in the roar of the ocean Found peace in the echoes of a cave And the trees of the field, they clap their hands But there's something in the sound of the saints From the lips of those you saved a redemption song will rise With a sound so full that it cracks the sky Whoa, whoa, we sing hallelujah Whoa, whoa, we sing amen Hear the sound of the saints as we march on to Zion Singing hallelujah, amen Singing hallelujah, amen I will hear the chorus of the angels Forever a symphony of praise Oh, I long to hear the voice of my Savior And He hears us the sound of the saints From the lips of those you saved A redemption song will rise Every tongue, every tribe, every church, your pride. Oh, oh, we sing hallelujah. Oh, oh, we sing amen. Hear the sound of the saints as we march on to Zion singing. Hallelujah, amen. Singing hallelujah, amen. Oh, Our hearts will rise, our song shall be Jesus Christ, our Savior, King forever. Our hearts will rise, the saints will sing Jesus Christ, our Savior, King forever. Forever. Hallelujah. Oh, oh, we sing amen. Hear the sound of the saints as we march on to Zion singing. Hallelujah. Amen. Singing. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, oh, we sing hallelujah. Oh, oh we sing amen. Hear the sound of the saints as we march on to Zion singing hallelujah, amen. Singing hallelujah, amen. Singing hallelujah, amen. Yeah. So grateful that, uh, that he does hear us. Uh, if you think he doesn't, I would uh, challenge you to check again. And there's so much pain and heartache that we've dealt with lately, and I know in my life personally, this last week here has been kind of a roller coaster for me. Um, but there's so much good that happens too, right? There's so much good, and if we focus on the negative, it's almost like it takes away from the good. Uh, and he does hear us. And, and uh, this morning, thank you guys very much for praying for me this morning. I was up here with the prayer team, and they just reminded me that, that God does hear our prayers. He hears our pleas. Um, to him, so find uh, find peace in that. I guess that's what I had to say. <laughs> Praise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Praise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief Raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody Raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me 
Well, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. Praise a hallelujah. Everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. You lost your hold on me. Well, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. Sing a louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. As heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. As heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. I'm gonna sing. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you can hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. Raise a hallelujah, raise a hallelujah, raise a hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah is a term for victory. You know that, church? Like, God's got the victory. And, and we need to rest in His victory. Amen? These days, they're going to come to an end. And God's going to have the victory. Hallelujah. Light in the 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. Worship you, yeah, I worship you. Oh, you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you're working. When I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Never stop working, you never stop, never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Cause you are a waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 One more time, adjust our voices. You are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Amen. Lord, we thank you for being the promise keeper in our lives. Father, despite whatever we're going through, whether it's pain and sorrow or, or goodness, joy, Lord, you are the promise keeper in that, Lord, that you walk us through it. You walk us through the valleys and you walk us through the, the peaks in our lives, Lord, and we're just so grateful for that. Father, I pray for a blessing over this uh, word that Ryan's going to speak over us today, Lord. I pray for transformed lives this morning. Father, God, I pray that you would bless your congregation and bless, bless our weeks, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you. Do you feel, do you, does anyone feel stronger now than when you walked in here? Amen. Do you know what happened? You chose faith. You chose melody. You chose praise. 
and it the Lord brought in angels uh, <laughs> strengthening angels he called them for us and we need to remember this lesson this morning the children when they praise him by faith not what they're seeing or been going through when the children praise him his power is released and we don't even know it's working in us until suddenly we start to feel different and we can release those concerns and those worries that we've built up in us. And he is so happy with that. Let us learn our lesson this morning. We need his strength and that's how we get it. We take a stand of faith and each child must learn it for themselves because we're all so unique. God loves us. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, church. I have a few announcements, but the first announcement is, if you didn't catch it on Facebook, the bulletin is now on the website. Sometimes I rattle some of this stuff off really fast, so there's a tab right on our webpage, and it has all of the upcoming announcements. It's a great way to find everything that's going on inside of the church body. Um, so, First thing, next steps, first class is today, but it's not too late. If you are joining us just newly and you would like to take the next step, know more about our church, get plugged in with people, next steps is a great way to do it. We'll meet for like an hour after service today and for the next four weeks. So we would love for you to join us to that. Also, if you're joining us for the first time on our webpage, as well as through our app, there's a connect card. We would love for you to fill it out so we can get to know you better and just stay in touch with you, especially those of you that are joining us online. It's wonderful to know who's there. And we have a free gift for you at the welcome table or coming in the mail if you filled that out. Um, also, Meat Drop. We have been blessed enough to be able to dispense like 200 boxes of protein or meat throughout the community. So July 20th at two o'clock, we will have the opportunity here. It's going to be a drive through situation. So if you come in through the back and we'll exit through the front and you just show up, pop your trunk or your back door open, we'll drop the meat in and you can keep rolling through. I believe that it's some hot dogs, some chicken patties and some sausage. So that'll be wonderful. It'll be a great opportunity. And lastly, youth. We are leaving for our two day youth event. July 26th and 27th, but the last day to register is next Sunday, the 19th. So if you want to join us, make sure to <laughs> make sure to fill out that application or text me and let me know so we can get one to you if you're joining us online. We would love to have you. With that, we will dismiss the children. All right, kids. Thank you, Jenna. So 18 months up to uh, fifth grade. You are welcome to go with Jenna to Children's Church today. And I want to say welcome. Great to see you here this morning. Great for those of you joining online. Great to see you. Thank you for being here with us. And today we are continuing on in our Meat Eaters series. The Bible teaches us that when we are newborn babies in the Lord, that we should crave pure spiritual milk. And so I just get, I get really excited when I'm around a new believer because they are just so hungry for God. And so they're, they're listening to Christian music all the time, worship music, and they're downloading as much information from good teaching online as possible, and I think that's just awesome. Now, the main difference between someone who is drinking milk and someone who's eating meat is that eventually, not only are you taking in, but you're also, you're also using a fork and a knife, and you're cutting into God's word for yourself and learning how to feed yourself. And so that's why we're calling this series Meat Eaters. And we're doing a little bit of a study of theology with every Sunday. And theology just basically means the study of God. Theos is God, ology is study. And so my hope from this series is that our appetites are being wedded to go deeper, each of us, into God's word for ourselves. Because the Bible teaches, or excuse me, that life teaches and experience teaches that when we have a solid theology based on the Bible, that leads to a solid faith which applied leads to a solid life. You know, we can't just have really good knowledge about God. We need to apply it and love people in the process and make it real to who we are. And as we do that, we become more and more like Jesus. So it's important that we have a solid faith. In addition to what we're doing in this series, we're also reading through the book of Proverbs, 
So uh, each week we're having someone review what the reading was from this past week, pulling out little tidbits and nuggets that God has shown them throughout the week and sharing that with you. So if you are uh, along with us this week, we have read Proverbs 13 through 16, and for next week we'll read chapters 17 through 20. It's always four chapters, so it's not uh, too long of a, of a read by any means. So I encourage you to participate with us in that. So in just a moment, Mr. John Dorsett's going to come up. Ah, just come on up, John. And he, I've asked John to uh, be the one to share his insights from Proverbs this week. And uh, it was a real treat what he shared with us this last service. So I'm excited to have him share with you now. Let's give John a clap, church. Hello. Okay. So apparently I'm supposed to slow down. I'm still really nervous. So if I'm going too fast or you can't hear me, just tell me to hold on. Uh, speaking on Proverbs 13 through 16, uh, we all know that the author of Solomon, uh, we have this continuation between good and evil, righteous and the wicked. Uh, Proverbs is a guide to living wise, the source of this wisdom, and at times reveals some of God's character. Uh, chapters 13 through 16, what I got out of it is, he wants us to listen to our parents. He wants or be content in whatever situation we are in. We are who we associate with. The wicked hate God, but the righteous love and cling to them. Those who love and trust in him will find knowledge and understanding. Sin is real, and God hates with a passion. God wants us slow to anger. God sees all. God is against wickedness and pride, and he hears our prayers. Now I'd like to read a verse that stuck out to me in particular. It's in chapter 13, verse 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get into trouble. Basically, you are who you associate with. The wise will honor God and a fool will disregard God by the way they live their life. And why is wisdom important? Ecclesiastes tells us using a dull axe requires great strength. So sharpen the blade, that is the value of wisdom. It helps you exceed. When I was younger, my parents used to always tell me, you are who you associate with. In my constant pursuit of acceptance, I kind of bounced from group to group trying to find my place. I didn't fit in with this group or that group for whatever reason. And unfortunately, unfortunately for me, the group that fully accepted me was the wrong crowd or the fools. And as they became my main source of friendships, the people I associated with the most, my, my behaviors began to change. My parents seen these changes and would constantly remind me over and over again, you are who you associate with. I even remember arguing. It had nothing to do with these friends or who I was associating, associating with, but it did. My association with fools led to more associations with fools and ultimately led to a severe cycle of drug abuse and violence. And when I finally had had enough, I knew I had to make changes. I had to rid myself of certain obvious toxic people, but I was still associating with fools. Eventually I made a decision to follow Christ. I made more changes. I got rid of vulgar music, changed what I watch, habits, etc but I was still in the company of fools. I thought by continuing to walk with them, I could be in a light in their life, except to all too often I found myself in old patterns. And after many more ups and downs, I realized I needed to make more changes. I needed to start walking with the wise. Some of the steps I took were, as I evaluated my friends, who was wise and who were the fools in my life. Throughout Proverbs, you will find definitions as to who is wise and who is fools. Basically, one will live for God, and the other denies or disregards God by the way they live their life. Next, I had to distance myself, and in some cases, completely eliminate them from my life. This was hard to do, because like I said, I thought I was their only hope of them hearing about God. I still love these friends, and I pray for them often. They are no longer who I spend all my time with, I am here to speak truth in their life, or if they ever truly need me, I am there. 
Our friendships now are on mine and God's terms and not on the world's. I no longer let them bring me down. And lastly, I had to intentionally gravitate towards wise friends. I intentionally set out to surround myself with wise, godly people. I found these people within the church. When I say intentionally, it was very intentional because this is not something that came natural for me. Now, I know my story is an extreme case of how associating with fools can get you in trouble, but associating with fools will no doubt, no doubt lead into some trouble of one form or another. My challenge is to you is to evaluate your friends, the one you spend most of your time with, but do so in a non-condemning way. Are they someone you would like your children to grow up and be like? Are they living for God or are they living for this world? Are they lifting you up or are they holding you down? Are you walking with the wise or associating with fools? Thank you, John. Well done. Well done. Scripture says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Right? So, John, thank you so much for sharing your testimony and encouraging us. And that was a great summary of Proverbs 13 through 16. So, this morning, we are going to be going into some doctrine, which, again, doctrine is just everything that the Bible teaches about one particular topic. But we are going to be talking about the doctrine of God's Word, the doctrine of the Bible. And specifically, is the Bible reliable? Is, is what we have reliable to live our lives actually by? Like, can we trust the documents that we're holding in our hands, whether that's in written form or on our digital app? Or are, they, are they truly good? Are they truly reliable documents? So we're going to get there. Uh, we call the Scriptures the Holy Bible, right? Holy means set apart, set apart, different. The one good question we should ask is, why is the Bible the best seller of all time every year? Do you know that the New York Times bestsellers list took the Bible off number one because it was number one all the time? So they said, okay, well, the Bible wins. We're just not going to count it anymore. <laughs> but you know, it's amazing to me. And why is that? Why does the Bible get copied, sold, printed, so much more than any other book, because it's alive, because it changes lives, because it's powerful. I want to take a look at it, the idea of it being alive in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. So I've read through the Bible a couple times in my life and a smattering of other scriptures, you know, daily, but one thing about the Bible, you know, you might say, well, I've read through it once, why do I need to read it again, right? I got it, I understand it, that kind of a thing. Well, the thing about reading the Bible is that we're not just reading the Bible. The Bible is daily reading us. It's daily reading what our intentions are, what our desires are, good or evil or whatever. And it has the power to separate the two. And so I've been reading along and all of a sudden I feel a tug in my spirit. And I'm like, wow, God is trying to speak something to me right from these words. And the Bible says it's, the Bible is understood. It's, it's spiritually discerned. In other words, Having a walk with God through the Holy Spirit is what allows us to understand and know the Bible in a real way. So if you have a hard time understanding the Bible, guess what? You are, you are not new, right? Like everyone at one time in their life has had a hard time understanding the Bible. But I want to encourage you, don't give up because it will change your life like no other document. So that's why we continue to read it. Another thing that we talk about, a theological term, is inspiration. The Bible is inspired. It's not just hot air, right? It's, these words are inspired. They're from God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God. Some versions will say inspired. Some will say breathed out by God. Some will say God breathed. And I liken that idea to God speaking at creation and His breath creating. The Word of God will create things in you and change your heart, and it's beautiful. 
It says it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. One person put it this way. He said, the word shows us what is right, which is teaching, what is not right, which is reproof or rebuke, how to get right, which is correcting, and how to stay right, which is training in righteousness. And I like that idea. Not only is it showing us what's wrong, it's showing us how to get right, and it's showing us then how to continue to live in a way that is right and honorable and pleases God, and ultimately is the best for us, right? Like, if you have an owner's manual, like, no one ever reads those, I get it, but let's, let's say you have a problem with your new motorcycle or your new microwave or whatever. Eventually, where are you going to go consult? You're going to go to that owner's manual. You're probably not going to say, this owner's manual is junk. Why would I read this? No, you're going to read it because the owner made it for what he made. How much more so for people? How much more so is God's word meant to teach us and show us how to live in a way that is great? So many people say, if you live your life according to the Bible, you're going to, it's not going to be fun. It's going to be boring and passionless. And my gosh, you've never probably read a Bible then. Like the Bible's exciting, it's full of war and conquering and heroes and, and encouragement and, and the kindness of God and the, the loving kindness, steadfastness of who God is. It's an amazing book. And it helps us to live our lives in the best way possible. Not in a condemning way, in a building way. So, isn't the Bible just written by a bunch of guys, right? Like that's the question. Isn't it just written down by man, isn't it just man's opinion? And Peter, who was a contemporary of Jesus, he talked about prophecy of Scripture. And he said, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God. So what happened is these men received a message from God, or they lived a thing with God, and they took pen to paper and they wrote it down. It was not just some vain imagination where they're like, ooh, this might be what God is like. No, they actually heard from God and they recorded it. And Peter, he even had some of Paul's writings at the time. So he had the Old Testament and he had part of the New Testament already. And he was saying, hey, you got to realize this stuff is not made up. This came from God's Holy Spirit and people wrote it down. So within the Word of God, we have proofs of why the Bible is so powerful and important. In addition, we have the testimony of Jesus himself. And hey, if a guy comes to you and he was once dead and is alive again, you might want to listen to what he says, right? So if Jesus said the Bible's legit, we can probably trust it. And in, in the New Testament, Jesus talks about the Word of God. And he uses the term the law and the prophets the Law and the Prophets. Now, the Law was the Law of Moses, which was the first five books of the Bible. So thank you, Moses, for telling us why we are here. You know, he wrote Genesis, all of the creation account, all the way up into the Law of Israel and um, the, the taking of the prom or not quite the taking of the Promised Land, but up to the point of taking the Promised Land when he passed it off to Joshua. So Moses wrote the first five, so that's the Law of Moses. And then the Prophets would have been all of the major and minor prophets that we have in today's uh, Bible, and that's, that's not majors, and they were more important. It's just the length of the book. So like Isaiah, Jeremiah, those are major prophets. The others are minor. And all of the prophets, their goal was to turn God's people back to him. They had turned their back on God. They were worshiping foreign gods. Their land was being invaded and destroyed. And the prophets were saying, hey, come on now, let's get back to God. And so when you read through the prophets, uh, you should not feel probably personally like the prophets are yelling at you they're yelling at the nation of israel hey wake up come back to the lord now throughout the prophets prophecy often has a a then word and a now word then and future past and future past present and future at times so with sprinkled within those prophecies for the nation of israel are prophecies about jesus like in isaiah 9 you're reading through and you're reading about um, the nation of Israel and, and who God's going to use. And all of a sudden you start reading about Emmanuel, God with us. It's like, what is that doing in there? Well, it's a messianic prophecy that is tied in with the rest of those 
uh, prophecies uh, of, of, the, of the major prophets. And so there are hundreds of prophecies about Jesus, about the future, also tied in with the prophecies for the nation of Israel. One person uh, did the math on it, and in order for one of the prophecies about Jesus, written in the Old Testament, according to the amount of time it took and, and the likelihood it would happen, one of those prophecies to come true. You could take quarters and fill the state of Texas two feet deep and pick up a random quarter, and that would be the exact quarter you were looking for. That is the odds that one of those prophetic words in the Old Testament of Jesus would come true. And there are literally hundreds of those prophecies that came true about Jesus. Sometimes secular authors will deny the Bible and its authenticity because they'll look back and say, how could someone 200 years earlier know about the events of what's happening in, in this part of the history? Well, because it's a supernatural document. It's alive. It's God. It's prophetic. So if you deny God, well, then, yeah, it doesn't make sense. But if you say there is a God, which, of course, the Bible points to, then you will say, wow, this is amazing. And so Jesus, he embodied the word of God. John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So God choos, chose to reveal himself in two ways. First was through words. He showed up to Moses. He showed up to Abraham. He said, I am the I am. He revealed himself in his character through what he said. The second way he revealed himself is through Jesus, who is the embodiment of the word of God. And so we can look to Jesus, and we don't have to question what God is like. You just ask the question, what was Jesus like? And you know what God is like. And so God chose to reveal himself. Aren't you glad that God chose to reveal himself? What an amazing thing. And, and, and I'm so happy that God continues to speak today through his written word, through the Holy Spirit to us directly. God wants a relationship with us. That's what, that's what being in the scriptures is about, to have a relationship. And I want to encourage you, you know, be in the word, be reading it. If you, if you, if you struggle with reading, I encourage you, there's so many good audio versions of the Bible out nowadays. Like right from my Bible app, I can have someone be reading the New Testament to me. And, you know, sometimes if I'm busy, I'll, I'll choose that option. And it's a great thing. Get in the Word. So in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. So basically, Jesus gave authority to the whole Old Testament in those statements alone. So again, if a person who died, who comes back to life, comes and says to you, these books are good, guess what? They're good. <laughs> They're good. In addition, though, we have not only the internal witness and Jesus' witness, but we also have understanding of the way that the Bible came to us. So a lot of people get confused and think, well, Surely the Bible lost translation some wells. Surely it, it was like a game of telephone where a child whispers one thing on one side of the circle. By the time it comes around to the other side of the circle, someone says something completely different. Like they're whispering, uh, the car is red. By the time it comes around the circle, someone says, Frank is dead. You know, like, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people think that's what we have in our Bible today. It's just not true. Uh, so one thing that we know for certain is that there was a group of students, Hebrew students, that transmitted the Talmud, which uh, was the, the Torah, the law, um, and AD 100 to 500, this was their responsibility. They had great reverence for the scriptures. So they wrote out synagogue scrolls, and they had to be written on specifically prepared skins of clean animals and fastened with strings taken from those animals, each skin had to contain a certain number of columns with, on that skin. Each column had to be between 48 and 60 lines, okay, and exactly 30 letters wide. All right, can you imagine just sitting there and counting out 30 letters? The spacing between consonant sections and books was precise, measured by hairs or threads. The ink had to be black and prepared with a specific recipe. The transcriber could not deviate from the originals in any manner. No words could be written from memory. 
All right, so it's not like a, a, a tail passed from one generation to the next. No, this is copy, copy, copy. The person making the copy had to wash his whole body before beginning and had to be in full Jewish dress. The scribe had to reverently wipe his pen each time he wrote the word God, Elohim, and wash again his whole body every time he wrote God's covenant name of Yahweh. Did they take this thing seriously? Like, way, way, they, they, taught, they kept it more seriously than we keep the folding of the American flag, right? This is how, how much honor they gave to God's word. After them came a group called the Masoretes, and they took over uh, making copies of the Torah from AD 500 to 900. And they added verses, um, word letters of each book, and calculated the midpoint of each book. After they were done writing out, they had to count how many words there were this way, count them back the same way, find the midpoint, count from the midpoint one way and the midpoint the other way. And if there was any more than three deviations, they ripped it up. Can you imagine like working for like a month only to have someone come and rip that puppy up? It'd be bad, but it's so good for us because we have the genuine word of God in the Old Testament. It was passed down with great care. And so we do not need to be afraid that what the Old Testament teaches us is the word of God. How about the New Testament? Is that reliable? Well, the New Testament, again, wasn't written by someone uh, like a great grandpa telling a good story to grandpa, telling it to dad, telling it to son. And maybe we have what he said. No, this was written by eyewitnesses, first-generation people who were with Jesus. And they wrote down their eyewitness accounts. In John 1, the Apostle John writes this. You can tell the excitement in what he's saying. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life. See, he used words like heard and seen and touched, and it doesn't get any more real than that. The eyewitnesses' accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John were actually investigated recently by a man named J. Warner Wallace, and Wallace is a homicide detective, okay? And, and when Wallace went to investigate the scriptures, so he, he actually was not a Christian before he began to investigate the scriptures, and what he found is that when an eyewitness document is exactly the same from one witness to the other, guess what? You're dealing with liars or you're dealing with a conspiracy. So there are little variations you'll find from Matthew to John that um, maybe one said there was 1,000 in the crowd and one said there was 5,000 in the crowd. And, he, and some people will say, well, that just proves the Bible isn't true, that New Testament isn't legit. And he says, no, 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 that makes it legitimate. Because if the stories from a first-person perspective are exactly the same, then you've all been talking to each other about what you should be writing. But if they have slight variations, it proves they're authentic. He actually came to faith because he said, beyond a shadow of a doubt, these documents are real. These are real histories about the person Jesus Christ. I think that's amazing testimony for us, that we can say, you know what, the words of God are real, they're for us, they're alive. And so, in addition, there's actually a, a scientific way of looking at the reliability of ancient texts and, and, and uh, documents, it's called textual criticism. And textual criticism looks at, first, the number of manuscripts, old ancient manuscripts, available to us. It looks at the time interval between the date of original writing and the date the particular manuscript was made, the shorter the time interval, the better, because that's more of an eyewitness account. And third, the quality of those manuscripts. You know, obviously, if they're legible, can you still read them, that sort of thing. So, for instance, historians have a high degree of confidence that Julius Caesar conquered Gaul. Why? Because we possess 10 ancient manuscripts of Caesar's writings on the Gallic Wars. We also have a high degree of confidence that Socrates lived, taught, and was eventually executed by drinking hemlock. I don't know what hemlock does to you, but it doesn't sound good. Why? Because we possess seven ancient manuscripts of Plato's tetralogies in which he documents the death of his mentor. 
the writings of Caesar, Plato, Tacitus, Thucydides, and Aristotle are all ancient historical documents considered reliable without controversy. No one in the world, secular world, is going to say those documents are false. And the time span between when they were actually written and the earliest copy available, the, the soonest one they have is a thousand year gap. Like that's a huge gap. And the number amount of manuscripts that they have between them ranges between 7 and 49. So they don't really have too many of the manuscripts and the time gap between when it was thought to be written and the copy is a thousand years. That's a long time. So how does the New Testament rank compared to these other ancient, ancient documents? Well, the time span of what we have between when it was written and the earliest copies is not a thousand years. It's 25 years. 25 years. And the number of original manuscript copies isn't 7, 49, 100. We have 24,000 copies of New Testament material that we are taking and can today, authors can go and look at those original manuscripts. This is, uh, there's a scholar named Ken Boa who wrote, while the quality of the Old Testament manuscripts is excellent, that of the New Testament is very good, considerably better than the manuscript quality of other ancient documents. Why do we say all this? What does it all mean? It means that the Word of God that you have in your hand or on your Bible app, guess what? It's the real Word of God. You did not get a false copy. And so we obviously have different translations. And so the translations, though, also go back to those original words. They go back to the original Hebrew. They go back to the original Greek and they then translate them into modern English. That's why we have different translations, why your Bible probably won't read exactly like my Bible will. But that's just a translation. That doesn't mean it's based off of falsehood. It just means the English interpreter decided to use bass instead of fish as an example. So we can trust God's word. We can trust that it's reliable. We can trust that it's accurate and that what it says is God's best for our life the best that he has for us. And so we can trust it. And do you know what the first book that was printed off of the printing press, the Gutenberg printing press? What do you think the first book was? The Bible. Why? Because it's so important. It changes lives. Uh, the first New Testament translated into English was by a man named William Tyndale. You might have heard of Tyndale's copy of the New Testament. Well, Tyndale was burned at the stake for making that copy for us. So thank you, William Tyndale. He was burned as a heretic because they did not want the common person to have access to the Word of God. And unfortunately, church history throughout the years has done its best to keep the Word of God out of the hands of, quote, ordinary people. And so that's where, um, like, you hear the word evangelicalism. Um, there is an emphasis on God's Word within our churches. Because it's empowering. It changes lives. It holds us accountable. And it, it's worth reading. It's worth knowing. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Church, we don't need to have a new divine revelation from God for us each and every day in order to live our lives. Why? Because we have a ton of revelation right before us in the Word of God. And the Bible says that the Word of God is spiritually discerned. That means if you have a walk with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is going to take the words off those pages and bring them to life to you. Not only so that you'll understand them, but so that you will be changed by them. In addition, God does speak and give us divine revelation, I believe, each and every day if we're open to it. If we're seeking Him and we quiet our spirit, Lord, speak to me. It's amazing. He will. Like the Holy Spirit is dying to speak to us. So there's an organization called the Center for Biblical Engagement, and I just want to close with this. But they did an eight-year study, and I've shared this before, but I think it's just so amazing to me. And they studied people before the study and after the study. And they would have people write down like the issues they were struggling with in their lives. 
before they came into the study. And some examples are drinking in excess, uh, viewing pornography, adultery, gambling, lashing out in anger, neglecting the family, overeating and mishandling food or money. You know, these are real issues that these people came into the study doing. And so over the eight years, they, they figured out how many times a day these people were reading God's word. They found out there's kind of like a magic point, and, and this is not from God's word, this is from their study, but to me it's worth sharing. They found that if you read the Bible four times a week, that your life will change to become more like Jesus. Four times a week. Now, that's not too hard to do. That's not terrible. Four times a week. Uh, open up your Bible app, church. Open up a, a reading plan in your physical copy of the Word. Highlight, underline, whatever you got to do. Get the Word in you. It will change your life. They found after they, they, they did this with people who read four times a week or less, their drinking in excess went down 62%. Viewing of pornography, we went down 59%. Adultery, down 59%. Gambling, down 45 Lashing out in anger, down 31 Gossiping, down 28 Lying, down 28 Neglecting family, down 26 and Overeating and mishandling of food or money, down 20%. Real people, real study, real word of God, still changes lives today. Why are we not reading it? right? <laughs> it's going to change you. It's going to bless you. In addition, they found that, of course, positive things came out of it. Uh, giving financially went up like 400%. Memorizing scripture up 400%. Discipling others up 231%. Sharing their faith with others 228%. And giving financially to causes other than their church up 218%. So these are just good things that God wants to bless our life with if we'll allow him by reading his word. I want to close with um, this statement. The author is unknown, but it, it just puts things so well. I, I love reading this. But I do want to encourage you, open a Bible plan, get in a Bible app. Uh, it'll bless your life. Also, um, before I close, I do want to make mention that we have a prayer team available today. So I'm excited uh, to be able to offer that again. We haven't been able to just with... Um, COVID going on and our prayer warriors haven't been able to make it, so we are happy to have them pray with you. So when I close in prayer, if you want prayer, please come forward. We would love to pray with you. So on the authority of Scripture, author unknown again, this book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrine is holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be saved, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here heaven is open and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good is its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It's a mine of wealth, health to the soul, and a river of pleasure. It is given to you here in life, will be opened at the judgment, and is established forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and condemn all who trifle with its contents. It's pretty good, isn't it? Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning. Jesus, I thank you for your people. Lord, I thank you for all those who have joined us today, whether here in person or online. Lord, I thank you that you are with them. Lord, you are for them. Lord, the Bible, reading the Bible is not for our condemnation. It's for our building. And its source is love because you are love. So, Father, I pray that we would begin to take in and eat on your word more and more and more because we love you and because you love us, not out of a sense of obligation or guilt or duty, but because we get to meet with the king of the universe and you have disclosed who you are. And we want more of you, Lord. 
So, Father, I pray that you bless your people today in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for their protection, for their peace. God, I, I pray, Lord, that you would just comfort each heart that's here this morning. Give them strength, Lord. Thank you that whatever comes our way, Lord, you are here with us. And we give you praise and honor and glory. And all God's people said together, amen. Amen. Well, be blessed, church. Great to see you here today. Again, if you would like prayer, I encourage you to come forward. If not, have a great week, and uh, we'll see you next week.